A'udhu Billah Minash Shaitan Allahin Ar-Rajeem Bismillah Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim In the name of God, most merciful, ever merciful And may God's peace and blessings be upon his holy prophet Muhammad and the purified members of his household and progeny Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad wa ajjil farajahum Brothers, sisters and respected viewers Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh And thank you for joining us in this latest installment in our series on the important topic of the afterlife. The lecture for today is inshallah going to continue uh, the sub-theme that we began in which we're trying to understand the relationship between this world and the next world on one side and we're trying to understand the relationship between faith action and how they translate into an outcome in the afterlife and of course when we talk about faith we talk about having faith or lacking faith and then action both you know performing righteous actions as well as you know misdeeds and sins and disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so we're looking at both sides of the equation so we're looking at this kind of theme from all the different uh, possible angles and, and permutations so each time we're going to look at it from uh, a slightly different perspective and so for today inshallah we want to look uh, a little bit more closely at uh, the actual role of belief and disbelief and the role that the this belief and disbelief play in the ultimate outcome in our ultimate happiness or unhappiness as in our outcome in the afterlife. So, inshallah, for the recap, uh, things are clear, although uh, I know that perhaps in the last lecture we covered a lot. It was, I think, a very dense lecture. Uh, so maybe a quick recap uh, is useful in this case. Um, we built on uh, the... As we began uh, speaking about the topic of uh, the relationship between this life and the next, we began by looking at a number of misconceptions as people look at their state in this world. They see themselves, uh, uh, this is the, the more common misconception, is that people uh, view themselves as having certain merits, certain comforts, certain luxuries and blessings and bounties, which they enjoy in this world. And uh, consciously or unconsciously, they uh, begin thinking that because they have these uh, enjoyments in this world, somehow this is going to also mean that they will have such enjoyments in the afterlife. And we dispelled the, the misconception, we explained some of its uh, possible sources, why someone may think that, uh, where this misconception may spring from, uh, and then explaining clearly that this is absolutely not the case. It is not because we find ourselves having certain types of enjoyments in this world, that this necessarily means that we will also uh, can expect to have those types of enjoyments in the afterlife. There is no such correlation, there's no such relationship of dependence between uh, the amount of what you benefit from, uh, what you enjoy in this world, and uh, what will be your outcome and what you will enjoy in the afterlife. And we also looked at the other side of this equation, the other side of this misconception, which is there are actually those who think that uh, having enjoyments uh, and luxuries and comforts in this world is going to necessarily translate into unhappiness uh, and lack of enjoyments in the afterlife. And so this is usually what we uh, end up referring to as people who have a misconceived or misunderstood idea of what ascetism means, you know, as zuhd, uh, that you are not attached to this world. Uh, so you you you, you uh, ensure for yourself the discipline and the uh, you know rectitude, righteousness, insight in giving things their their proper due, which translates, unfortunately, for these people in thinking that because you enjoy anything in this world, it necessarily translates into lack of enjoyment and, and being deprived in the afterlife. And so we explained that that is absolutely not the case. And once again, just like the first misconception, 
The idea is not how much or how little you have to enjoy in this world. The idea is where are you directing your attention? What are you after? What are you considering to be your objective? The objective from your existence. What is your target? What is your de object of desire? What are you trying to accomplish? And if you understand your answer to this question, then this is going to ultimately dictate what happens in the afterlife for you. Not how much you have to enjoy, but rather where are you focusing your energy and your attention and your will and your desire as a human being? Is it towards the afterlife and is it towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? In which case, go ahead and enjoy the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made available for you to enjoy as he wishes and as he wants you to, uh, so long as you do it appropriately and in a way that does not contravene and it does not transgress uh, against anyone else. And this is why we have the instructions we have in our religions. And, uh, you know, here's a, uh, a quick remark or a quick link to uh, this entire uh, theme in our religion of uh, balancing between the different priorities. And that includes balancing between understanding the priority and the primacy of the afterlife while recognizing that we also have duties and we may also enjoy our lives in this world. Uh, so I think all of this topic uh, is well understood. I don't think that it requires more, uh, you know, explanation. And we said that perhaps a powerful metaphor that we see repeatedly in our religion, whether in the Holy Quran or in the narrations, is that of the garden, uh, in which uh, this life is the garden. And your job here and your opportunity here is to plant this garden uh, as best as you can because you are going to be stuck and you will have no other way uh, of harvesting or reaping the benefits of what you have done in the afterlife except uh, what you were able to do while you lived in this world. And so whatever actions you were able to forward for yourself, uh, you know, as represented in the seeds that you are planting in this world, those are the only things awaiting you in the afterlife. And so if this is properly understood, then this already solves a lot of the misconceptions. And we understand why there is a focus on this specific um, metaphor, let's say. So that's one. And then in the last lecture, in which we continue to discuss this theme, this theme of the relationship between this world and the next world, we tried to look a little bit more closely at the relationship between our faith and deeds in this world and the outcome in the next world. And so here we said there are a number of theories, a number of different interpretations to explain this relationship. In one way, someone may think, and I think this is the, the superficial understanding, the preliminary understanding of the majority of the people, when they hear you know, what religion has to say about what awaits those who believe or those who do not believe. We see that religion says, basically, if you have faith and you do good, you are going to be uh, given heaven, paradise, and everything in it. And if on the other side, you are going to reject the faith and do sins, commit sins in this world, then you are going to be uh, punished in the afterlife and this punishment will take the form of hellfire. So when you look at the type of uh, input, let's call it, so your faith and your deeds that you are inputting into this equation and what's the outcome of that input, which is let's say paradise, heaven, or hellfire and punishment, it looks like these are two completely different things. And so uh, at a superficial level, at a, you know, at a quick glance, if you look at this, you say, there's absolutely no real relationship between these two, real in the sense of existential. It's not a causality in the sense that it is, uh, you know, a clear ontological causality. And we gave examples to this. We said, perhaps this looks more like a contractual agreement or a conventional agreement uh, based on convention. And we gave multiple, I think, examples. Uh, we said, for instance, um, as a matter of convention, a society may decide that it's okay to speed while you drive, while another society decides that, uh, you know, speeding is going to be 
uh, tolerated up to a certain speed, and then there's a difference. Different societies will decide what that maximum speed is going to be, and then different societies will also decide what that punishment will look like if you go uh, against that law that has been put in place. And so one society may decide that it is a certain type of fine or after uh, a certain repetition of this uh, crime that you're committing, that you're going uh, over that uh, speed limit, this contravention, uh, then it's going to mean that you might be jailed or, or you may lose some privileges such as driving, so on and so forth. When we look at the act, which is going above a certain speed, and then the outcome, which is being fined or losing a... There is no real causal relationship between these two things. It's a matter of convention. A society decided that this is how they are going to uh, deal with certain acts. But there's no real causality between these. Or as we said, someone comes and delivers a service in your house, and then you agree that in return for the service, you pay them, for instance. It's a matter of convention or it's a matter of contract. So when we look at the outcome in the afterlife, the actual punishment or the actual reward, is it in this type of relationship with our faith and deeds in this world? And we said no, although this may look like it is the case and what's being referred to in certain verses of the Holy Quran. And in fact, even some of our scholars may have understood, seem to understand that this is the uh, type of relationship that dictates uh, faith and deeds and therefore reward and punishment. The truth is that the relationship seems to be, to be clearly explained in other verses of the Holy Quran as being an existential one. And here we need to explain in a little bit more detail what we mean by an existential relationship. And so a type of existential relationship, for instance, is that someone, um, you know, here we have it as a weak versus a strong uh, existential relationship. A weak one would be, for instance, where let's say someone jumps from a, a very high elevation. Okay, someone that they, they jump, I don't know, from five, five stories and they end up breaking some bones when they land. Okay, so clearly the act and the outcome are not one and the same thing. These are two different things. The act of jumping, the act that you performed and the outcome, the breaking of the bones are not one there's no identity between them, but there is a causal existential relationship so that if you do this, this is the outcome. It's not a matter of convention. It's not people who sit together and they can decide one thing or another. In the case of someone jumping, let's decide one thing or another. You put fire beside a dry piece of paper, it will burn. There's a causal existential relationship. Or someone, if you want to you know, make it a little bit more complex in terms of an example, someone who exercises and therefore has good health or someone who studies, uh, you know, very hard uh, and therefore they have knowledge. So the state of having knowledge and the state of studying, these are two different entities, see, two different states, but there's a clear uh, logical and existential causality between these two. And so this may be one way of understanding the afterlife, but in fact, when you look at the verses of the Holy Quran, as we did, we saw that it seems to be going even further than that. It is not only that there is a causal relationship of existence, of ontology between these two types of entities, the outcome and the, uh, the prelude or what you input into the equation, as we said. No, in fact, it is one and the same thing. And so we, when we went through some verses of the Holy Quran, clearly it says those who are uh, performing certain types of sins, for instance, the ones who are uh, stealing away from the orphans in this world, in the ladina ya'kuluna amwal al-yatama zulman, those who are eating away uh, at the wealth and the possessions and the money at the inheritance of the orphans, what they are truly doing is eating a fire in their bellies, right? And then this is where the whole Quran is basically explaining to us, this is the true, the, the reality, the true reality of this act, except that when human beings look at it, it simply looks like someone who is getting wealthier, someone who is getting richer through a certain act, which is, I don't know, through cheating or trickery or 
theft or whatever it may be, they are taking away. There's an external appearance to this. And this is what we're accustomed to. And the majority of us, that's all we see. But here the Holy Quran is saying clearly, the reality of this act is that this person is eating a fire inside of themselves and in the afterlife. Once they go in the afterlife, they will also be made to be shoved into and be made to scorch in a uh, blazing flame. And so this is the, in the afterlife. But what's happening right now is that they're eating a fire in their bellies. But because of the type of world in which we live, you only see the superficial aspect of it. As for its reality, it's kept for the afterlife. And this brings us to the theme of the notion that we talked about a few times when we were talking about the afterlife, when we said it is a world of truth. And so the appearances, the superficialities of this world go away and we see the reality of an act in the afterlife. And this is one of the main differences between this world and the next, is that in that world, you remove those appearances and therefore the whole Quran says, hadid, right? So that today your sight is metal sharp, that you're seeing things as they truly are, not like you are seeing them through the appearances and the distractions and the distortions of this world, the material world, the world of, you know, uh, zina and la'ib and lahu that we live in, and which prevents us from seeing the reality of things. And we explained, I think, some of the reasons why it is the case in this world that, uh, you know, we do not see things as they truly are. We said some of this is because of who we are and how we decide to behave in this world. And so there is a constant accumulation over our hearts, over our spirits that prevents us because of our distractions our constant focus on the material, that we fail to see the reality, the inner malakut, the inner reality of things. We're stuck at the mulk, we're stuck at the external appearances, right? And on the other side, it is also the type of world that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created so that we actually go through it as a test to see who will get uh, tricked by it, who will put their focus only and solely on those superficial things and who will actually be able to go look beyond them to have the more penetrating insight and see things as they truly are and not be stuck at the uh, external superficialities. And we said this could be a very, very powerful way of understanding our belief and our actions. If you actually think that what awaits for you in the afterlife in terms of reward and punishment is simply the same action that you are performing, that you are committing in this world, then of course you're going to be thinking twice or 10 times or 100 times before you perform that action because you know it's not like something else is being given to you in the afterlife. No, no, it's the exact same thing that you are performing that will be given back to you. So this truly makes you realize what it means when the Holy Quran says, and ahsamtum, ahsamtum li anfusikum, wa in asatum falaha. When you perform something that is good, when you do good, you are doing good for your own self. Really and truly, because there is nothing else going on except you and your act, and then that act being given back to you as is, except in its true form, not in the appearance in which it manifests itself in this world and which is usually all that we know from these acts okay and so inshallah all of this part is clear but we said this is opening up this whole idea of the relationships between faith and deeds and the outcome in the afterlife you know makes spring a number of different questions so that's one of them you know that what is the type of relationship is it real is it a matter of convention and contract, as we saw. So we answered that question. Other questions, as we, we said, is what is the relationship between belief and righteous deeds? And inshallah, we're going to talk more about that in the next time. So the relationship between having faith and doing good. And on the other side, between lacking faith and you know sinning or disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so misdeeds. So lack of faith or disbelief and misdeeds, what's the relationship between those? And on the other side, the relationship between faith and act, okay? Another one is the relationship between good and bad deeds, between good faith and bad faith or lack of faith. 
as we said. And inshallah, today we're going to touch a lot more on this. So, some of these questions, if we continue in this same line of thinking. Until now, it should be clear that for someone to try to ensure their eternal happiness, there's two ingredients that are required. Faith and good deeds. To the extent that you have faith and good deeds, so you are also securing your eternal happiness. And to the extent that you lack faith and you commit bad deeds, you are also securing uh, the, uh, you know, extracting yourself away from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or your eternal unhappiness. Now the question is, clearly it looks like there's two ingredients here. There's faith on both sides, having and not having. And then on the other side, the actual act. Okay, so performing good acts, performing bad acts. These two ingredients, what's the relationship between them and how do they affect the outcome? In other words, do I need both faith and act in order to reach the outcome? And what if I have only one or the other? What does that mean? If I have the faith independently, the faith on its own, regardless of the act, if I have the faith, does this secure an eternal happiness? And if I'm lacking the faith, does this secure eternal damnation, eternal unhappiness? And on the other side, if I have the good deed, does this secure the eternal happiness? And I have the bad deeds, does this secure eternal unhappiness? And, or are we looking at everything together? Is it more cumulative? Is it the sum of? So it's a mixture of. And are we looking at each independently or all taken together? And then what if someone has the faith without? So you have only faith. You have only good deeds. Okay. But you don't have the other side. So you have the faith, no good deeds. You have the uh, or the other side, the disbelief, but no bad deeds. What happens then in the cases where you have only the faith side? Is it possible to have the faith, so the good side of the faith, with the bad side of the act? So you have bad deeds, you have misdeeds with good faith. Someone who's a believer, but full of sins. What happens in that case? Or on the other side, someone who is not a believer at all, someone who disbelieves, who rejects the belief, but they come with a lot of good deeds. What is the outcome in those cases? Okay, and... What if someone lives their lives, a portion of their life, in a certain manner? Let's say they live with the faith, they live with the good deeds, and then another portion of their life, they live it in bad deeds and lack of faith. What happens in those cases? So, of course, we don't have time to cover all of this, but this is where the discussion is going, and this is what we're trying to cover. And the more we understand the relationship between this world and the next, between faith, act, an outcome, the more we understand these notions and how they relate to each other, the more these questions, the answers to these questions become clear, inshallah. So when we come to this question about what role does one's faith play in the outcome, and then how does it link to our deeds? When we look at this question, we see that this has been a hot topic of discussion and research and back and forth between Muslim scholars since the beginning of Islam. And you can clearly find a number of you know, works and scholarship and reports addressing these issues since the first century uh, of Islamic history. And there are many, many different schools. This would require one or more lectures if we wanted to get into what every school of thought uh, how every school of thought has answered these questions. But generally speaking, you know, I thought there's at least three that are very worth mentioning and very, very quickly. Um, uh, otherwise, this becomes a, uh, a lesson in the history of theology. There is a school of thought that focuses a lot on the act. And so they say, for instance, that if someone performs any of the greater sins, 
it is equivalent to having become a kafir, having rejected faith, no longer having belief, and therefore, if they were a good Muslim before, then they can be considered murtad, you know, an apostate, okay, a heretic. And, of course, these are usually the schools that are close to in thinking or actually the khawarij, okay? So the, the, kha, the, kharij, the kharijites uh, or the khawarij, as they are referred to, are the ones who initially were the first in Islam to say that if someone performs one any of the greater sins, then in those cases they are no longer considered to be a mu'min. They have fallen into kufr, point blank. And so this is how I refer to it here. It's all about the action. Regardless of what the person may believe or not, we're only looking at the external act. What has the person done? This, if it's a greater sin, then this actually means that this person is no longer a believer. On the other end of the spectrum, so this is, of course, one, one end of the spectrum. On the other end of the spectrum, you find those who say it's all about your belief. It's all about your internal intentions, what you carry in terms of faith. And so if you carry the, pro the proper faith, that's it. You are guaranteed eternal happiness. Now, this eternal happiness may be more or less depending on your deeds. But the moment you carry the correct faith, you are right away secured, guaranteed eternal happiness. And this is a big school uh, that sprang at about the same time and right after they were referred to as al murjia right? And uh, the, in these cases, they, they really emphasized that even someone, they, they basically took very lightly to, you know, the performance of sins. We, in fact, have narrations from Ahlul Bayt salam warning some of their companions, telling them, you know, rush and hurry to teach your children before al murji get to them. Because they are going to uh, distort their faith and their understanding of religion. And then you are going to end up believing what the murji believe, which is that you actually think that the moment you have the minimum required of faith, regardless of how you behave, you are secured eternal happiness. Right? So this is one extreme. The other one says, the moment you perform any of the greater sins, you're going to hit to hell for all, for all of eternity. You have become a kafir and a murtad. And of course, we have everything in between. And that, in fact, includes, uh, you know, Wasr ibn Ata, one of the, uh, you know, very famous lines about this. This is, in fact, considered to be the reason why uh, ibn Ata began his i'tizal began this whole school of thought and theology called al-Mu'tazila or al-I'tizal. He used to be a student of Hassan al-Basri, right? Uh, and before that, uh, he, he was with the son of Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiya, Abdullah. Uh, and in any case, you know, many of them today, that, that's a separate topic, but a lot of people consider him to be, you know, one of the first Sufis and perhaps the first person to have been referred to explicitly as a Sufi is uh, Ibn al-Hanafiya, Abdullah ibn al-Hanafiya. Uh, and so he had studied and he was his companion, had studied with him, and then he had moved to Basra. Uh, and when he remained in Basra for a while uh, with al-Hasan al-Basri, at some point there was a disagreement between him and his teacher. And so he uh, no longer came to their to their halaqa, to their uh, lessons. And uh, this is when his teacher, Teacher Al Hassan Al Basri said, uh, And so, as a result of this, they became known as Al Mu'tazala because he refused to go there. And this is said to be one of the main points of contention between them when he was asked, What happens to someone who is performing a sin and they are supposed to be a believer? Are they uh, a mu'min or a kafir so are you basically leading towards the opinion of the khawarij or are you leading towards the opinion of the murji'a in which case he said amrun bayna amrain this person is no longer a believer and also cannot be said to be a disbeliever so he is somewhere in between he's in limbo in some sort of limbo in between belief and disbelief and any in any case as i said this would require lengthy uh, discussions to go over the history and the evolution of these thoughts 
uh, where they sprang and who was reacting to whom and in what way and what were their arguments. The, the, these are the books of theology are filled with them. Uh, and it's a fascinating topic for those of you who are interested in it. All this to say, you know, these topics have been researched since the beginning of Islam. And the correct answer to this, when it happens to, you know, when we come to the Holy Quran and when we come to the narrations of Ahlul Bayt, السلام, clearly, it is clear that not all misdeeds, not all sins are going to amount to, can be considered, can be deemed as someone having left the faith. It is not because you have performed a sin that you are going to be said as being a disbeliever, a kafir, and therefore guaranteed eternal damnation, guaranteed eternal unhappiness. Okay, This is not to say that because you have faith, you can continue to perform and commit sins without any repercussions. We're not saying that there are no repercussions, but from uh, if you have faith from performing the sin, which everybody agrees is a sin, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that this is going to amount to a punishment, this is not the same as saying this person is going to be eternally in hell and that this person is no longer a believer uh, and this is eternal damnation and they have left belief. They are disbeliever equal to kufr. Absolutely not. So the act itself is the act and the belief itself is the belief. Now, when we come to the belief, if someone has the correct belief system, they believe in the right things, is faith alone, is this belief alone sufficient to say someone is going to have eternal happiness as a murji essay? And again, again, the answer is absolutely not. So both of them are wrong. The khawarij in saying that someone who performs a greater sin has now become a kafir, absolutely not. And someone who says just because you have the right belief without any of the you know, derivative uh, good actions that should come out of that belief. So you have the right belief, but you don't do anything with that belief, or you perform all sorts of sins with it, and you still think, you still expect that you are going to uh, be secured with eternal happiness. Absolutely not. So both of these extremes uh, are absolutely considered wrong, and they are contradicted clearly and explicitly in the verses of the Holy Quran and the narrations uh, of the Holy Prophet and the Imams. And so what we're trying then to find out is what is the correct understanding of Iman? When we say Iman, when we say belief, when we say faith, what do we mean by it? And then, of course, on the other side, what is it that we mean when we talk about Kuf, of course? And so in a lot of ways, this lesson is about formulating uh, a much more precise, much more accurate, nuanced understanding of what we mean when we say Iman. And of course, this would require more than the overview we're providing, but at least gives you the, this gives you the, the kind of structure and objective of the lesson and where we're trying to go. And of course, as we said, we're going to be continuing to talk about this topic in subsequent lectures as well. And so when we come to Iman and Kufr, when we come to belief and disbelief. What is the reality of Iman and what's the reality of Kufr? And of course, here reality, we mean, you know, at a definitional level. We're not going into the true reality of it. There's a certain, you know, philosophical understanding here, but we're not looking at beyond that, okay? So there's no mystical uh, Arfani, for instance, uh, understanding of any of this or occult internalist understanding of any of this. This would be for more advanced lectures. So what's the Iman? What are we talking about when we talk about Iman? Clearly, Iman, belief, faith, what it is is a an inclination, a leaning of your heart, of your soul towards something. But that leaning, if you're leaning towards something, it's because there is a something. So what is it? It's the result of your knowledge. So when you understood something, when you now have a knowledge of something, you have to decide what to do with that knowledge. If you decide to accept it beyond just understanding it, you actually accept it, you integrate it into who you are and the way in which you view your world, then this has now become as part of your belief. And this is very important. So now you understand that 
there is a leaning towards, and of course, there's varying degrees here, a leaning towards, an inclination of your heart, your mind, your spirit, call it whatever you want, which is different. That's why we're, we're distinguishing between what's happening in your heart and what's happening in your mind or, you know, your, your brain and your pure reason or pure logic. With your pure reason or pure logic, you may get to understand something. The image of the notion, the conclusion of an argument becomes very clear to you. You understand it. But do you accept it and integrate it in a way that makes you lean towards it, submit to it, and to its consequences, that is faith. And this is where you see, first of all, that faith is going to be an entire spectrum. It's not a black and white, on, off, uh, you know, one or zero kind of reality. It's not a dichotomy of just two things. It's a spectrum. In other words, it's an infinite spectrum. And you could be anywhere in there, and it seems to have two ingredients, two axes on that spectrum. On the one side, your knowledge, and on the one side, your inclination towards that knowledge. So someone may have more or less faith based on those two ingredients. So knowledge alone is only one of those ingredients. How much knowledge you have is going to have an impact on how much faith you have, one. But two, how much you attach yourself to that knowledge, that's a different ingredient. Someone may have a very high level of knowledge, but they're not inclined to it. In fact, they may even reject it. The knowledge is there, but you reject it. Or the knowledge is there, but you really act according to that knowledge fully. And that's the ideal case. So the degree, the intensity of attachment to the knowledge varies. And the knowledge itself, your understanding, the depth of your understanding, the sophistication, the complexity of your understanding and your knowledge is another ingredient. And so the more faith you want to have, you need both of these. The, the knowledge and the degree to which you lean towards that knowledge, to the point where you grip it, you attach yourself to it, and you submit fully to it, and therefore to its consequences, whatever derives out of that knowledge. Okay, and so clearly, if this is understood, if this is how you understand what iman is, what faith and belief is, then clearly you understand that knowledge on its own is not sufficient. You can't say just because you know something, therefore you believe in it. No, not at all. You may know something and still reject it and still not be inclined to it. In certain cases, you have the knowledge about something and yet you reject it. And so these are the more obvious cases. And we have many, many examples of this and we're going to soon see some of them. The whole Quran talks about people who know the truth. So at the level of your you know, cognitive ability and your logical reasoning, you are able to clearly say you understand something, you know something, and yet you still reject it. When the Holy Prophet, for instance, performs a miracle in front of you, when the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala perform the miracles to clearly show the people around them that they are sent from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with a message to the people and some of those elites, especially, and some of those people rejected that. It's not because the, you misunderstood, and it's not because you lacked knowledge, and it's not because you lacked understanding. It is because you decided after you understood and you acquired the knowledge to reject it, not to submit to it, okay? And this is what's going to, before I jump there, there's another here, uh, another, uh, you know, point perhaps important to mention for our own spiritual growth. This is where you start seeing the importance of always really appreciating, understanding the responsibility that comes with knowledge for ourselves. Yes, there's a, a kind of a social responsibility, my responsibility towards others once I have the knowledge. But what's, what's, what's my responsibility towards myself? Once I know that something is wajib, once I know that something is mustahab, once I know that something is makruh or haram, there's a responsibility that I did not have before that I now have clearly. And so every time that I know that there's something that is tawab and I'm not acting accordingly, I'm failing that knowledge or failing the fullness, the completeness of that knowledge. And this is, so we may take the more extreme cases and the more obvious cases and looking at those 
let's say, who reject the truth after they know it. And that's good. Of course, we, we need to recognize that. But at a more spiritual level for ourselves, this becomes a very important lesson. Are we not doing the same thing too? When you look at a truth, when you know that truth, when you understand that truth at your own level, if you fully understand something, you fully understand the benefits of Salat al you fully understand the benefits of the charity, you fully understand the uh, karahiyah of doing certain things or you know, even the haram of doing certain things. Is this not doing the same thing? Is this not at your own level for your own self? Is this not a rejection of the truth in the same way? Okay, so in any case, this is more for the practical, you know, uh, ramifications of this belief. And then to further, to better perhaps understand, and this opens the door to other discussions, so I'm just hoping to kind of give you the keys to this, to, to open the, 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 to spark those uh, ideas in your mind at least, and maybe go and research and think. This is where you see one of the differences or one way of understanding what Iman and Kufr are and distinguishing between Iman and Ilm. This is not the same thing. To have knowledge is not equal to. You may have the most knowledge on earth. It doesn't mean that you're the most faithful person on earth. Okay, There might be someone who has a fraction of your knowledge and they have so much more faith than you do. And they do much more with the knowledge they have at their level than you do with yours. So we have to be very careful with these notions. That's one. And two, you, this is where you see perhaps the true merit of faith over knowledge. In that knowledge is compulsory. You have no choice to know. If you are in a certain situation, and let's say you're in a situation where you're hearing certain, they call them premises, right? The parts of an argument. The conclusion of that argument is necessary. And so the knowledge that you now have, or if you are somewhere and you witness something, and now you have knowledge of that, you witnessed it, you looked at a tree, you looked at an event, and now you have a mental image of what just happened. These are simpler examples, but you could talk about reading a book, listening to a lecture, doing a BA, whatever it may be. The mental image that you have of anything, this is what we refer to ultimately as the knowledge. And that mental image, once those premises have taken place, is compulsory. You, it's not a voluntary act to have the knowledge or not. What may be voluntary is you ensure to get those premises. You go to school, you expose yourself to a lecture, and in that case, whatever comes to you is going to be the knowledge. But once you are in the situation where the knowledge is coming, then the mental image, you have no power over it. It will form in your mind in a compulsory manner. You're forced to have that mental image. And this is where you see the clear difference between knowledge and faith. Faith is a matter of recognizing that mental image and then submitting to it and then putting aside your arrogance that would make you perhaps reject it, refuse it. You put that aside and you submit, you display openness to that knowledge. You show your humili humility towards that knowledge. And this is where you start seeing the difference between just having the knowledge and the faith and the merit of the faith and how it brings you back to spirituality and understanding your place in the world and your relationship with the truth and your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, so all of that just simply to keep in mind. And then the consequence of all of this, perhaps the, the point from all of this is that this does not stay at the level of understanding and then being inclined and open to and humble before that knowledge. That's two. So you know, and then you lean towards what you know, and then you act on it. And this is the key ingredient. You need to act on that knowledge. You need to manifest the knowledge that is internalized. It needs to manifest in who you are and how you act and what you commit to and what you don't in terms of behavior. What are you doing that shows that you carry that knowledge as opposed to this one, and therefore that belief as opposed to this one? Okay? 
I think all of this is clear. Now, a lot of this we don't need to repeat for the, the other side, which is Al-Kuf. But not, Al-Kuf can be two things. And this is very important. In fact, there's more definitions, but if we want to simplify it, we say there's two ways of understanding Kuf here. In one way, <clears throat> we say that Kuf is simply not having belief. This is very general. So someone who does not have, does not carry the belief in something. But the reason why they don't have that belief could be anything. The bottom line is this person does not carry the belief in them. Okay, so that's one definition of kuf. The other definition of kuf, and we're going to explain that in a little bit more. The other definition of kuf is to say someone who refuses to carry the belief. These are two different interpretations or two different meanings to kufr. In the first case, the reason why you are kafir, therefore you are a disbeliever, is in the sense that perhaps you lack the knowledge. Perhaps you have doubts, you have misconceptions. The knowledge never reached you or it reached you in an unconvincing way. Okay, this is very different. These are all very different states, scenarios from someone who has now truly been exposed to the truth, someone who understood the truth. So they have knowledge. The mental image is clear in their mind. There is no misunderstanding about it, but then they decide that they are going to reject it. They are going to refuse that truth. They're going to do it out of perhaps stubbornness, out of perhaps arrogance, or any other reason. They do not submit, they do not open up to, they do not lean towards the knowledge and its derivatives. So you simply refuse to believe. And this is different from someone who simply lacks the belief that is more general. And in a lot of cases, let's say, especially in the verses of the Holy Quran and elsewhere, we have to distinguish which type of kufr is it referred to. Are we referring to the kufr in the first sense, which is just lacking belief? Or are we talking about a specific type of kufr, which usually is the one that is used the most in the Holy Quran and elsewhere? This is the kufr that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about these people. Clearly, the truth has come to them. Clearly, they know it, they understand it, but they decide to reject it. They decide to refuse it. So I'm looking at the time and what, uh, what else I have to cover. We were going to continue with the topic, but I think I'm going to stop here. I think it's a natural uh, good stopping point. And then we will add the, the second portion of uh, all of this, inshallah, in the next time. Um, and, you know, on the one side, I do apologize that we're going a little bit slower in these lessons, but I think they are very, very key, very important. And once they are understood, they solve a lot of misconceptions and they answer a lot of questions for us. And I think it's worth taking the time to understand the arguments and the notions uh, appropriately and understand how the verses of the Holy Quran come to confirm all of this uh, and ensure that, you know, our understanding is correct. So inshallah, I'm going to stop here. Uh, if you have any questions or concerns, please uh, go ahead and, uh, you know, either speak up or use the chat. Uh, and uh, inshallah, we will continue with this topic the, uh, the next time we meet, inshallah. Ahsantum, Sayyidina. Jazakumullah khair. Allah I had a question on your last uh, segment. Yeah. Uh, you said, so which type of kufr is Quran referring to? You said that, if from my understanding, that clearly Allah says in the Quran, uh, where the, the evidence has come to them in so many numerous ways, uh, and that because the truth has uh, been seen to, by them and they have refused it out of arrogance or something else, how do we. Um, Call the people nowadays who may not have heard about uh, the knowledge or the evidence. There are some uh, people who may think that 
the, from the uh, from the other um, from the first uh, argument of uh, explanation of kufr that says okay whoever does not have faith is a kafir and so everybody who's not a, a muslim or a people of the book or or from other uh, specific religions they are from kufurs so it is a misconception of course but i wanted you to uh, probably explain if we may have this notion in our school of, of thought, uh, like some of the other uh, schools or uh, religions have, for example, the Gentiles being the not Jewish or the not from, not from the people of the book. Can we refer to the people who are not Muslims who are not Christians or, you know, who could be atheists, for instance, as just non-Muslims, but not disbelievers? It's an excellent, excellent question. Um, and inshallah, we're going to provide the answer. Of course, now, we can't say that there is an ultimate consensus on this, okay? And this was going to be, you know, if I were to forward uh, a little bit here, uh, you know, th this is why I said, I don't know if you can see uh, what I'm showing. The first word here is different views on what is the minimal threshold of belief and kufr. And so, inshallah, the, the next time that we meet, we're going to be talking about this, and this is going to be our ultimate answer, inshallah. And of course, as we said, this is based on the curriculum that we're using. But we will see that this is uh, an our school of thought. This is a majority opinion. This is the, the stronger opinion. Uh, and we're going to get into it uh, in that what constitutes the minimal threshold for someone to be considered a kafir or a mu'min? And this is something we talked about early on in the lessons when we began all of this series on theology and beliefs. We talked about, uh, you know, these, I think I referred to them at that time as concentric circles. And we said, depending on your view and your understanding of religion, some may say that uh, belief is only this very small restricted circle and so you have all of these 250 conditions that have to be met before someone is considered a believer. And of course, this is going to be uh, applied even within your madhab and within within the madhab. So within the madhab, depending on what you consider to be the truth in the madhab, you're going to exclude others and say that their faith is complete or incomplete. And so this is not even at the level of a Muslim or a non-Muslim. Okay, so... But that is, if you want to be very technical, then you'd have to go back to every scholar and see how do they define Iman and Kufr. Okay? Generally speaking, and inshallah, we're going to come to the details of this a little bit more, but generally speaking, if you go through the verses in the Quran, it seems to say that those who believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and who believe in his messages and who believe in the afterlife in the manner in which we're presenting, then they are considered mu'min. And now, after this, anything more than that is going to be going further on that spectrum of faith, further on that spectrum of Iman. But it's not up to me to consider everybody kafir unless I'm using it in a relative way. So I say someone may have more belief than someone else. Someone may have less belief than someone else. This person only believes this, but they still meet the minimal threshold. And another person has more belief than them. I don't consider them kafir. I don't consider them exactly like you said. I may say they are, for instance, non-Muslim. That's not enough. You may still you may be a non-Muslim and still be. Of course, we're using the term Muslim here, not in the Quranic way. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says it's Prophet Ibrahim who called you al-Muslimin, and basically, therefore, afterwards, all those who follow his tradition, all the Abrahamic faiths would become Muslimin. Okay? If we're not using it in that sense, we're using it in the more restricted technical sense of those who follow Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi specifically and his uh, teachings. So in those cases, we can refer to them as non-Muslims and still being a mu'min. They are believers. But they do not have the same degree of detail that we have once we have accepted the teachings of Prophet Muhammad And so here's where we get into that whole discussion of, so what happens if you are lacking some of that detail? And how do we ensure that you're still meeting that minimal threshold? So inshallah, we're going to come to these details. But the idea that we may refer to someone as a non-Muslim, 
absolutely. This does not mean necessarily, and this is why it all depends on how you define your faith. It does not necessarily mean that you are a, ka a kafir uh, by necessity or automatically, just because you do not uh, commit to all the articles of faith. Okay? And so this is where it becomes very, very useful. And this is a big topic and it requires, you know, a drilling into uh, in our communities and into the believers' minds to really emphasize the point that faith is a spectrum. Faith is a continuum. And you can always add more to it. And in some cases, it does not mean that because someone is lacking your specific level of faith, that they are therefore a Catholic. And if we apply that logic, and it's a very dangerous logic, then between us, there is no one who will be left a woman. Because there's always someone who is a, at a higher level of Iman, at a higher level of faith. And so to them, you are a kafir because you are lacking their level of faith. And so if you want to follow that logic, then you are going to fall into some very dangerous conclusions afterwards. And so it's, I think, a wiser and smarter and more correct way to say, we don't look at what's the maximum or what my threshold is personally. It's what is the minimal threshold that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to in his holy book as being Iman. What are the things that are the necessary ingredients of Iman? And those seem to be Allah's belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his messages and the afterlife. So inshallah, we're going to talk more about this, but this is an excellent and very important question. Ahsantum jazakum Allah al khair. If there are no more questions, then uh, see you inshallah the next time and uh, keep me in your prayers and I shall keep you in mind, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.